So welcome to this short introduction to the Lower Paleolithic. I'm Patrick Cuthbertson and we're here just a couple of miles north of Oxford in the UK uh, at the village of Wolvercote. So a substantial stone tool assemblage was found in gravel deposits near here, including up to 78 hand axes. Now, in this introduction, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of the Lower Paleolithic. Uh, I'll look at how it's defined as an archaeological period uh, and also what kinds of technologies are described for it. Uh, and what species of humans are currently known as well from, from that period. Uh, I'll also look at a couple of key issues in the Lower Paleolithic um, to give a sort of flavour of the kinds of debates that are taking place. Um, the Paleolithic is the Old Stone Age and therefore uh, the Lower Paleolithic refers to the very earliest, uh, the oldest of the old. Uh, the term Lower Paleolithic is a technological term, so it relates specifically to the kinds of technologies that were um, sort of produced during this period. Uh, now, of course, the vast majority of these are stone technologies, but some organic technologies have been found as well. Now, what we refer to as core and flake techniques, or what Graham Clark has, has called Mode 1 technologies, um, are the very earliest of the Lower Paleolithic technologies, and the beginnings of hand axe technology, Clark's Mode 2, are also present during the Lower Paleolithic. So the timing of the Lower Paleolithic varies globally because it's linked to the stone tool technologies, as I've said, rather than uh, being linked to something more concrete like geological periods. And in some sense, this is really a holdover from the culture historical, uh, culture group way of thinking that was prevalent uh, when those periods were initially defined. So uh, Paleolithic archaeology, and especially the earliest archaeology of the Paleolithic, drew very heavily on geological theory and technique, as well as culture historical archaeology. Now, part of the reason for this is just the sheer scale of the time span that the Lower Paleolithic uh, operates at when compared to later periods. So if you were to take an A4 sheet of paper and draw all of the archaeological periods on it to scale, the Lower Paleolithic would take up most of the page and all of the other periods would just fall within a few millimetres uh, at, at just one end of the page. Uh, but there is this sort of ongoing tension in the Lower Paleolithic between the elements of, of culture history and geology that formed the, the initial discipline. Now, the archaeology of later periods is more obviously human, uh, and the apparent scale of change is just so much faster. Um, but the Lower Paleolithic is much more than just a sort of shadowy origin time for humanity. It represents more than 99% of the human past in absolute temporal terms. So, with the vastly different time span, there also comes a change in the logic of the questions that we can ask. We can't study the names, organisations or military manoeuvres that are just so beloved of historians uh, and also archaeologists working in historical periods. Our questions have to be far more basic. For instance, where were ancient humans capable of living? Uh, how did they use natural resources? Um, what drives the evolution of certain traits, uh, such as bipedalism, for instance? And what was their social life like? Because we, we know that they must have had a social life, like other great apes do. And even, potentially, what was the nature of their cognition? So, the earliest stone tool technology, as I mentioned, is known as Mode 1 in Graham Clark's system of stone tool modes. Now, the oldest representative of these industries used to be the Olduvai, which was named after the famous site of Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Now, subsequently, the site of Lemequi in Kenya has replaced this with an even older industry that has become known as the Lemequian. Now, what all Mode 1 industries have in common is the fact that they are what we would call core and flake industries, meaning that simple flakes struck from cores constitute the primary component of these assemblages. They do include other kinds of tools as well, such as choppers, discoids, polyhedrons, and uh, spheroids as well. Now, these other tool types are on something of a continuum, and it's not always clear, for instance, if if a chopper is genuinely a core tool in itself, or whether it's simply a core. And these tools are generally perceived as being in some sense simple, and as archaeologists I think we often undervalue the skill of the ancient humans who produced them. 
So, for instance, there is some evidence at uh, the early mode one sites in Africa and Asia for raw material selection and management, which suggests that their understanding of raw material and the process of stone tool manufacture is already quite advanced in some ways. Now, anyone who has tried to nap stone for the first time knows that the very first objective of the learner is simply to produce a successful flake. And some people don't manage that even in their first session. So I think we do potentially uh, a disservice to ancient humans when we describe their technologies as simple. Mode 1 technologies have a very large time span. Uh, so the very oldest site of Namekwi is about 3.3 million years. Uh, but it's a bit of an outlier. So the oldest Mode 1 site that we might refer to as belonging to the older one is Ngona in Ethiopia, which is around 2.6 million years. There aren't any hominin fossils associated directly with the artifacts at Lamequi, but all of the ancient humans that we know of in Africa at this time are Australopithecines, or Kenyanthropus, if one accepts that species as separate from the Australopiths. Now, the older one is potentially associated with a whole mix of different species that existed in Africa during this time, including early or transitional Homo, the so-called gracile Australopithecines, and also the, the so-called robust Australopithecines as well, which are sometimes also known as the Paranthropines. Now, in some sense, Mode 1 industries are replaced by Mode 2 industries, but in some sense, they're also um, continuous throughout the Stone Age as well. So in every age where stone was worked, simple flaking of cores is a component of the industry. So we have to be cautious when we identify isolated finds that look like Mode 1 technologies. Really, the only way to be totally certain is if we have a discrete, well-dated assemblage that only contains these kinds of core and flake technologies. But this isn't always a guarantee of a Mode 1 industry after, after the advent of hand axe technology, as we shall see shortly. or hand axe technology represents a big change in the Stone Age record and probably also represents a big change in the life ways of ancient humans at this time. Hand axes themselves are a bifacial core tool which emerges in Africa around 1.7 million years. Now, bifacial working did exist in Mode 1 industries but only in the form of occasional bifacial choppers. Uh, mode 2 represents a real focus on the production of bifacial edges and also to some extent the use of bifacial napping for flake production on cores. Archaeologists still aren't totally certain what the primary function of a hand axe would be and very probably they had multiple functions and this may have changed through time as well. So butchery is a very popular explanation but many of the earlier less refined examples of hand axes don't seem all that appropriate for such a task. Woodworking and soft plant processing are also possibilities, among other things. Now, they may also have functioned as mobile cores. The appearance of hand axes seems to coincide with a few other behaviours that we would associate with increased mobility, which might support this interpretation of them as mobile cores. Now, you've probably heard the term Acheulean or something similar used to describe hand axe technology. This refers to the site of saint Achille in France, um, they are also sometimes called bifaces in reference to their bifacial edge. Now, not all bifaces are hand axes, but all hand axes are bifaces. And there end up being some rather strange debates about this in reference to areas like East Asia, uh, which Western scholars have traditionally thought of as not having any hand axes. Mode 2 industries can also include cleavers, which are very similar to hand axes, but have one straight cutting edge along part of their length. These are very common in the Acheulean industries of Africa and also in the Acheulean industries of India as well. Now, the emergence of Mode 2 technologies in Africa is associated with Homo erectus, although this species is known to have dispersed out of Africa and into Asia initially with a Mode 1 industry. Mode 2 industries are subsequently associated with later human species in Europe, such as Homo antecessor and Homo heidelbergensis. So this is an example of a hand axe, which is unlike the kinds of hand axes that you normally see in museums, but is a fairly common sight in the field. So as flaking on both sides, with flakes struck across the surface from the cutting edge. 
In plan, it comes to a point, which we would simplistically call a pointed type. So this is rather than it being a rounded type, which we might call an ovate. It doesn't have a cutting edge all the way around like some hand axes do, but it has an unworked base or butt. There's even an unworked section of cortex on one side, but this isn't always the case with hand axes. In terms of recognizing these in the field, look for the sinuous bifacial edge. Also look for flaking inwards from the edge towards the center and either these classic triangular or teardrop pointed forms or rounded oval forms. It's very common to find hand axes as surface finds, especially in arid regions where the sediments have been eroded away. As I noted previously, core and flake technologies continue on through the Stone Age, so it becomes problematic when we want to define Mode 2 technologies on the presence or absence of hand axes alone. So if I have a large core and flake assemblage with a single hand axe, for instance, as is fairly common in Europe, it might be problematic to describe that entire assemblage as Mode 2 or, or an Acheulean assemblage. Now the problem is even harder with surface assemblages, which might include a whole mix of material from different periods. Now in Britain there's an ongoing debate about a core and flake industry known as the Clactonian, which would be contemporary with the Schulian industries in, uh, in that part of Europe. There is still debate over whether this industry truly exists as a separate industry or culture, or whether it simply represents just another facet of a Schulian behaviour. Organic technologies also exist in the Lower Paleolithic, but there are so few of them that it's actually quite difficult to draw any sort of general themes from them. Chimpanzees use a number of organic items as tools, and they even modify them slightly for different tasks. So it's probably fair to assume that ancient humans had an organic component in their tool use. Because organic technologies don't preserve as well as the stone tool technologies, we probably focus too much on the stone tool side of what must have been a system of complementary stone and organic technologies. They certainly used antler and bone hammers to flake stone in particular ways, and certainly worked wood with stone tools as well. Now, probably the most impressive example of organic technologies preserved from this time are the Schoeningen spears from Germany. Eight wooden spears have been found at the site which have been dated to around 400,000 years. And therefore, they're contemporary with Homo heidelbergensis and an Acheulean technology in Europe. Now, a number of other more fragmentary find spots around Europe appear to suggest that spears or, or perhaps lances were a component of the organic technologies prevalent at this time. In terms of further reading, I can recommend Schickentoth's Making Silent Stones Speak, as it's an excellent and engaging introduction to many areas of lithic analysis and the ancient human record in Africa. I would also recommend Robin Dennell's The Paleolithic Settlement of Asia. For anyone interested in the British Clactonian debate, which I mentioned earlier, I can also recommend John McNabb's Stones in Contention. Thank you for listening to this short introduction to the Lower Paleolithic. I hope it's been useful. I think there's a bug in my head. <laughs> are you, you going to be making a hand axe, for instance? Let's wait until the shouty guys have gone past. Yeah, yeah, Graham, Graham, I'm cycling so hard. Thanks, guys. All right. This will be, what, the fifth take of this?